Welcome to the Classical Top 5. I'm Tommy Pearson and with me as always are Richard Bratby and Charlotte Gardner. A little departure for us today as we head into the world of musicals. There's often a fine line to be found between musicals and some operas. Operettas of course were the musicals of their day and then there are the movie musicals that were never originally stage productions. So as a genre musicals can be quite hard to define but that's the fun of it and I wonder which way we'll go today. We are so lucky to have with us as a very special guest, direct from New York, a composer and lyricist who won a Tony and a Grammy for his best known musical, the mega hit Hairspray. His other musicals include Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which played in London's West End for four years before transferring to Broadway. Catch Me If You Can, based on the movie, and another movie, Mary Poppins Returns, which earned him his sixth and seventh Oscar nominations. As a film composer, he's particularly known for his scores for Rob Reiner films like When Harry Met Sally, The American President and A Few Good Men, as well as those glorious creations, Sister Act, Sleepless in Seattle and South Park, Bigger, Longer and Uncut. And that's an outrageously brief version of his CV, just scratching the surface. It's Mark Shaman. Hello, Mark. Thanks ever so much for doing this. Thanks for asking, Tommy. It's nice to be here. Um, I... I wouldn't be wrong in saying, I think, that you have lived and breathed musical theatre, haven't you, for, for most of your life? That would be true. That would be totally true. Even when I was scoring movies, I would uh, sit and think, like, well, what would this character's opening number be when I was trying to develop a theme? I think on City Slickers, I even... Um, uh, he's hot shit with a pistol. He's big. Crystal, if he gets pissed, he'll shoot you dead. Well, see, I've already cursed. And we have <laughs> a minute, a minute into it. Pretty impressive. <laughs> but but what about when you what about when you were a, a child though, Mark? Because I mean, you you were into it pretty early on, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I listened to that Mary Poppins soundtrack. That was my my earliest memory of listening to anything. And also a musical is Mary Poppins. I mean, I listened to it religiously, endlessly, and learned everything one could ever learn about songwriting from the greatest song score ever written and the orchestrations and arrangements by Erwin Kostel. Equally fascinating to my four-year-old brain. I mean, I was four years old when the movie came out. And I guess I must have listened to it year after year. I mean, because at some point I was actually going, what are those... What's making that chord shimmery? Why am I getting excited about something that's about to happen? I, I later learned, oh, tremolo strings. We'll just do just that. Um, yeah, I mean, that was it. And then when I was, I think, around 12, a friend brought me with her. She went to audition. There were two women in my community who started a musical theater workshop in the summer because uh, my school system had, like, no music and didn't put on musicals. So thank God for these two women, Judy Cole and Manya Unger. They put on this thing. And so so when I was in elementary school, I, no one knew I played piano. I mean, my aunts and uncles, you know, I, I would play for when they came over. And then, um, so then Cheryl brought me to these auditions and I was like, wow, can I audition to play piano? And they said, well, sure, kid, play. So I went over to the piano and I played. And I was like, at that time, I was like, you know, Mozart of showbiz piano playing. I mean, <laughs> you know, I just had that style in me. And I remember turning around and everyone was just silently staring at me like a freak of nature. But I liked them all staring at me and I was hooked from that <laughs> moment on. Mm -hmm. And that was for The Sound of Music, which is not on my list, but it could be. <laughs> um, well, how did you get on with your list? Because, I mean, there are an awful lot of musicals out there. So yeah, how, well, I, how did I really, you whittle I, it down? I, 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 because it's impossible to choose, I thought I would choose five. And even there, it's hard to choose just five. Five musicals that have a, a, a meaning in my life. Because, I mean, how could I possibly, you know, I went through a list yes, last night. It was like 150 <laughs> musicals, all yeah. considered like it was on one, you know, list that was online. Uh, I thought, why? Well, so uh, that's what I've done. I've, I've chosen five musicals that are, are just very meaningful to my life. 
Well, let's and, start. Uh, let's let's start then. Let's dive in. What's what's the what's your first choice? Well, the first one is the um, the second year of that summer theater musical workshop in my township of Scotch Plains, New Jersey. We did Gypsy. <sighs> so whether or not, and by the way, my list is not going to have any surprises or like I'm not, you know, I'm 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 sticking with the the good ones. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Gypsy. Even if I hadn't done it, it's you know arguably the greatest musical ever written because not only is the score brilliant, but the book is brilliant. And so it all comes together so well. So there we all were like, you know, 12, 13 years old, putting on gypsy. I wonder if they let them do that now. Do they, <laughs> is, is gypsy canceled? Well, first of all, you're not allowed to say gypsy anymore. So I wonder if, if it's a lot. <laughs> and then, you know, the fact that we had like, you know, 13 year old girls in their bathing suits playing strippers, <laughs> I wonder if they'll still let people do that. <laughs> I'll let you ask a question. I realize I'm just talking and talking and talking. But. No, no, I, 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 you, you went in a direction I wasn't quite expecting. Um, but uh, really? no, but no, 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 not with Gypsy. I mean, with 13 year old girls in 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 bikinis oh. playing prostitutes. But you know, um, no, I, I, I guess we, we should mention this is a Judy Stein uh, score with yes. with lyrics by Stephen Stephen Sondheim. Sondheim. Yeah, so it's a pretty pretty amazing mix uh duo there yeah i as a matter of fact when people talk about what's your favorite sondheim lyric i mean there's you know there's a lifetime of brilliant lyrics but the one that always freaks me out is uh from gypsy um mama please take our advice we aren't the lunts i'm not fanny bryce <laughs> Mama will buy you the rice if only this once you wouldn't think twice. <laughs> so there's three rhymes going on there. And yet it all ends with that wordplay of if only this once you wouldn't think twice. And I was like, wanna know what what did, he, what did he start with? Did he start at the end with the <laughs> idea of only this once you wouldn't think twice? Or did it just sort of happen? Advice, lunch, <laughs> Bryce. <laughs> it just it blows my mind. Yeah. So okay. Well, the, part of it. the 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 musical score, I, I guess. I mean, uh, some of the songs in Gypsy are uh, have lived outside of the musical, as, as and I'm sure that's going to be a theme of of many of the musicals we talk about today, isn't it? That that some of the songs are just taken out, and and s singers really run with it. I mean, Bette Midler, for example, famously did Gypsy, right? And you you have right. worked with Bette Midler, well, for almost her whole career over 40 years yeah oh my lord yeah <laughs> um and, oh and i got to go with her that's right i forgot about this how do you forget she, <laughs> at one point i was going to musical direct that when she did it for television and then i ended up being busy and i couldn't believe it or not i couldn't do it um but she brought me with her to jewel stein his apartment he said uh bring me your man so we can set the tempi um so i actually got to sit how could i have forgotten about that i sat on a piano bench with jewel stein and discussed gypsy my god i <laughs> i guess i forgot because i i was zooming on a cloud of i can't believe this is happening so <laughs> i'm so glad it came up just now yeah. uh <laughs> well gypsy gypsy was a very popular choice with um our listeners on uh and friends on Facebook, uh, as it was always going to be. I think, Richard, you you were um, fist pumping when uh, when Mark mentioned uh, Gypsy. <laughs> Boy, well, I mean, what, what can you say? You hear the first note to that overture, certainly on the original cast recording. Wow, you are on on Broadway, aren't you? It's just you know, didn't he say blow the roof off to the trumpet players on that opening yeah. night? Yeah, and um, it's, it's exactly what Mark says. This thing about musicals in, in the world we usually operate in, us three, classical music, opera, all that sort of thing. There's this huge reverence and respect given to the composer. The composer is a genius. They are the creator. Don't even mention the librettist. Choreographer, forget it. Um, and then we hear these sort of, you know, and, and it's, it's, we forget it's the whole package. We, forget, You know, it's so, so vital on, on musicals. And, you know, the, the world of musicals, as far as I can see, is littered with great scores that didn't work, that flopped. Um, it's, the music alone just does, isn't enough, is it? And, and it has to be the whole package. And I, I think we say, you know, the yeah. world of opera forgets that at its peril as well. I mean, the world is full of, um, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I was reading um, Mozart's letters a while ago, um, 
putting on a Domineo in Munich in 1780 for the first time. And it reads more like Richard Rogers or Alan J. Lerner's memoirs or Sondheim um, than anything in the world of classical sort of studies. He, he's, you know, he's talking about, you know, we got re rehearsing late last night, stayed up rewriting this bit of act two. We need some music to cover the scene change. The singer's not happy. It's not matching her voice. I've got to readapt the vocal line. Got some new lyrics in today. And it's, and it's far more like, reading a Broadway memoir <laughs> than anything in the world of classical music. And yeah. at that point about Gypsy, you've got knockout lyrics, knockout songs, the whole package works. It's a hell of a show. It's full of scenes that stick in the minds, full of huge roles for big characters. Um, and yeah, it's everything. And also, you know, one, one, one section you didn't mention yet is orchestrations. Mm. Oh, God, the yeah. Greatest well, orchestrations. Yeah. I mean, and that overture, you know. I haven't played in a million years. Uh, bah, 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 bah. Oh my god! And then da, 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 I can't play it anymore. As a kid, oh my god! As a kid, I could have really wowed you. I gotta practice. You know, it's crazy <laughs> that during this whole pandemic, that I could be down here practicing and getting my chops back. Chops. Now it's now chops is just the name of my dog, but um, <laughs> yeah, Gypsy is just everything about it just coalesced. Huh? Uh, it, Charlotte, how did you get on with this uh, subject, musicals? Uh, how, how have musicals been in your life? They've been absolutely huge. Um, I, I'd say that um, we've already talked about Mary Poppins, but I would say my musical life began with Mary Poppins. It was probably the first songs that I sang around the house as a kid. I grew up with my parents laughing about Dick Van Dyke's appalling Cockney accent. My dad's a Cockney, so this mattered. And just... Everything about it. And it was funny. For this, I came back to it again and listening to it from an analytical, classical perspective for the first time. Of course, I realised why I loved it back then. I mean, that first number, Sister Suffragette, um, the idea that he was channeling the Victorian music hall. And that... We're clearly soldiers and petty coats. Right. I, I, I'll brilliant. try not to constantly it's interrupt brilliant. you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's wonderful. And you know, the, the lyrics, they are so clever. I mean, our daughters' daughters will adore us and they'll sing a grateful, yeah, chorus. Sing a grateful it's, chorus. It's mm. it's not very far removed from in tropical climes there were certain times of day. It's straight into the Noel Cloward, Cloward, the music hall, and it just makes your heart sing. Um, but in terms of in thinking of what my choices were, I mean, Mary Poppins was one, but then I was thinking, what is it about a stage show? What, what works on the stage? And so often I find you've talked about the orchestration and it all comes crashing down when I enter a West End theatre and you have a kind of tinny orchestra doing a sort of a sub job of what a symphony orchestra might have managed. And one musical that I thought really nailed it in terms of the orchestration and just got everything right um, was actually, it's not very fashionable, it's an Andrew Lloyd Webber one, um, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, which also started my sort of performing, one, one of the first things that I performed on stage. Mm. And I think what is, you've got all sorts of cultural references, a really clever script, you know, um, I think probably a lot of the time these days, so many people aren't going to get the whole 70s, you know, when Joseph says to Potiphar's wife, I don't believe in free love or his his sheepskin days were gone. I mean, that's so rooted in the 70s. But 60s, also... 60s. Six, well, both, isn't it? Wasn't it? It was 70. No, 70. no, 1968 is very oh, much a 60s it? thing. Oh, yes. Oh, and okay. so is free love, of course. <laughs> oh, yes. But I mean, what, what I find so brilliant about this one is just the musical variety that Andrew Lloyd Webber gets out of the pit. I mean, you've got Elvis Ferrer, which, which can be done with a small rock band, those Canaan days, French accordion, um, the Benjamin Calypso, you know, he's as honest as Cocoa Nuts. It's all stuff that you can do really, really effectively with fairly small musical forces. And I think that not every single West End show nails that one in quite the way that the, Joseph did. The other brilliant thing about it, I mean, you mentioned it, is that Joseph is often the first experience that people have of performing mm -hmm. musical theatre, isn't it? Because it is that sort of pocket version of a musical um, yeah. that, and, and easy to learn that kids of all ages can, can do it. When, when I was 20 and I was looking for things to do, I worked as a copyist and I did a lot of musicals. And one of them was Joseph for the touring version. And it was in the days when they were getting rid of all the strings in, in pit bands and, and putting it all on keyboards and yeah, my job was to do all about. that, which is such such a shame. I and mean, it was it was it was uh, yeah because you you want those those real strings even for something like that. But it was mm. it was morphing into a more pop version anyway of the show. It's very different to the first recording. I was listening to it actually the other day. 
Um, but one of my other jobs I did at that point was I did the, I got this new musical came, came in to do copying and it was for a, a musical called Kiss of the Spider Woman, which was written by Kander and Ebb. And I love Kander and Ebb. And one of my choices would always be Chicago. I love Chicago for lots of reasons I'll come to, but um, that was an amazing experience to be able to sit as I did next to John Kander during the rehearsals with the band. And then, because everything was done handwritten, of course, in those days. So I would make all the, you know, all the errors, uh, make, make uh, correct all the mistakes in the parts and all that kind of thing. But to sit next to him and to see how that all worked and see how the rehearsals for a, a show worked, that was absolutely amazing to be in the middle of all, all of that, never forgotten. And do you, do you know Kiss of the Spider Woman, Mark? Do you know that musical? Uh, well, I mean, I know it from having seen it, but I don't, I, I didn't have the cast album. You know, once I grew up, <laughs> I stopped, you know, which is bad. You know, I stopped obsessing over albums uh, like I did you know, when you do when you're a teenager, mm -hmm. especially. So I only know it from my one viewing of it. Uh, but it, it and, actually, and even, it's more, even more sacrilegiously, I've never seen Joseph and I've wow. never heard the whole score. Wow. I know, but I'm going to make up for that later on in my list. Okay. With something. <laughs> but the uh, Kiss of the Spider Woman, the Spider Woman was played by uh, Cheetah Rivera. So right. uh, that, of course, she, of course, is a, a long time Kandra and Ebb collaborator and was in the original Chicago. What I love about Chicago is how cynical it is. It's got to be the most cynical musical ever written. It has such a dire view of <laughs> the media and of uh, politics and well uh, almost anything in fact and that's what I think I love about it, it has that dark edge to it but what I think is brilliant about it is John Kander's genius of being oh, able yeah. to create songs every time he'll do it he'll he'll do a song it, it's the little techniques he uses to such great effect um, where he'll use different tempi or he'll halve the tempi of the song or he'll double the tempi of the song to, to maximum effect. And he does it all the time. He does it in Cell Block Tango in Chicago. He does it in um, we, we Both Reach for the Gun, which is I, one of my favorite songs in all musicals, I think, where it's about a, a lawyer basically being a puppeteer controlling all of the media to say what he wants them to say and when he gets them to say it he says you've got it and I just think that's that's the moment in the musical where you realize how cynical it is but the the joy in that music the brilliance of that of those tunes but also just the way he constructs songs and just when you think he's finished with a song he brings in another absolute cracker of a melody that you didn't see coming I don't know quite how he does it and one the other thing about John Kander and music, he is the undisputed king of the vamp. Yeah. I mean, and even with <laughs> in Chicago, it's just the, the chords. Yeah. And then of course cabaret. Whoops, I, I hit a wrong note. Wait. <laughs> and then the all time. So even before the song was started. He's already got your ear. I mean, man, that, I mean, he's just the greatest. My, my last John Candor story is that the, the day, the night before I sat with him in that rehearsal studio, I had been in a pub in Birmingham singing New York, New York in a drunken karaoke. Um, and then to be the next morning sitting next to the man that wrote it was one of those moments in your life where you think, goodness gracious, <laughs> this is a very strange life indeed. But uh, anyway, got to get got to get a candor and Ebb in there because I, I think they're they're absolutely amazing. Um, Most definitely. OK, uh, Mark, another another choice. Well, another one, because I'm a suburban Jew <laughs> that I it's a law that I must choose Fiddler on the Roof. Uh huh. Oh. For 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 many reasons, besides its brilliant art artistry, it was I think the first musical I actually saw on Broadway. My parents took me to Fiddler because, as I mentioned, it's a law. And so, <laughs> and what's very strange is that f when I came home, I used to obsess over the the folio, I guess you call it, you know, the thing that you buy, you know, with pictures and. T there was uh, this one girl who had, was in the show who had just this great smile and the picture of her looking up at Muddle, I always used to be fascinated with it. I'm, I'm not making this up. And then years later, I realized it's Bette Midler. So 
the first time I saw Bette Midler, it was in Fiddler on the Roof. And I, even then, I became obsessed with that smile on her face in the folio. And then I also did Fiddler on the Roof. When Once I started doing shows after the, uh, those two ladies um, started their summer thing, one of them, Judy, she, she then brought me with her, kind of put me in her pocketbook and brought me to all the community theaters around where I grew up that she used to direct. So now we're with adults at community theater. And she would bring me in and they say, Judy, are you insane? I mean, there was just this little pimply 13 year old and she'd go to you know, point to the piano and say, Mark, play. And then I'd play and then they all shut up and I got to be <laughs> musical director for all these shows, which is also, that was my schooling. I, you know, I never had um, formal, I, you know, I took piano lessons, but I never had real formal training. But once I started doing shows and would get the piano vocal scores, mm. And could actually like sit, listen to the cast album and look at the music. And it wasn't just like the simplified version of sheet music that you'd buy in the store. It was the real thing with the real good chords and and showing you what the flute line are. and Or even pointing out to me, yes, those are trombones that are playing that. Mm. I mean, that was everything. And, and I remember I used to go to Colony Music in New York because I could just take a bus to New York. And I bought... I would steal money from my father's wallet and I would go and buy p piano vocal scores. So they're not on my list, which is crazy, but I, I wrote down honorable mention company follies and a little night music because that was, I came into theater right after those shows had been on, but I bought those piano vocal scores and you know, that was it. I would be so obsessed with those piano vocal scores and listening to the album at the same time. And Oh my God. So, so, uh, so Sondheim is a curious one, I think, because you know, I think everyone will uh, will acknowledge what a you know, impact he's had on on musical theatre and the rest of it. But, but of course, I mean, Gypsy's Gypsy was a huge hit. West Side Story, which I know we're going to talk about, it is a huge hit. Both of them with his lyrics, but his the ones that he does himself, where he writes the music as well. Although they're they're sort of they're well known and people love them, they've never been massive hits. I mean, he's always. You know, said there's all, there's so probably so many reasons why that would be be the case. A more sort of literary, I guess, a little bit more sophisticated, whatever that means. I don't know, but they've never quite hit the mark, have they? With the the big hits that he's also had as just as a lyricist. Well, that's also he. I mean, obviously, his music is more sophisticated, as you put it. But he also came of age. You know, once he started writing his own music, at the beginning of the time when popular music and Broadway music went their separate ways. I mean, yeah. so before him, you know, that's where popular music got so many of the great songs were from Broadway musicals. So it's just, you know, socially it changed, the culture changed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So sort of bad timing in a way. Okay. Oh, but well, I forgot we were on Fiddler on the Roof. Yeah. <laughs> Fiddler on the Roof. I mean, what a beautiful, gore. another one that also, because the book is so good as well yeah. as the score. I mean, I was thinking this morning, my favorite moment from Fiddler on the Roof that literally, I know I'm going to do it. And then I think, well, I'm not going to do it because I know I'm going to do it. And then I do it anyway, which is I always <laughs> sob <laughs> like that noise comes out of me every time when Tevya finally says to another character um like what does he say uh tell her tell her god be with you whatever he says to uh Havala, who he won't speak to but when he finally says one thing to the oh my god i'm gonna cry right now thinking about it um hmm. it's so moving oh my lord there's a really fascinating documentary that was made about Fiddler yes. on the Roof. It's, it's on it's actually for those that are in the uk it's on sky documentaries at the moment and Topple, uh, who and the big revelation in the documentary for me is Topple doesn't look like Topple in the movie at all. Right. <laughs> um, it's amazing because he doesn't have the beard and all the rest of it. But no, you hardly recognise him. But he talks about that very moment, and he wells up talking about that very moment yeah. as well. Um, it's a story, obviously, that touches so many people. And the idea through the documentary is it's not just a story specific to that story. It can be translated yeah. to lots of other people who feel dispossessed. Who feel like they need to move, or, or, or um, you know, or, all the other um, different um, things that are are involved in that story can be translated 
like any great work, I suppose, can be translated to any other community as well. Yeah. I mean, that show was really famous for that. The fact that mm. they thought they were so fearful that they were writing a show that had a, a small audience for, and it ended up being so accepted around the world because of just what you said, the, the themes are so universal. Yeah. The, and some great tunes as well. Let's not forget. Oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. Richard. Um, what about some of your choices as well? You, please tell me you've moved a, over for us a little bit into operetta at some point in your choices. Um, well, wait, wait, where do you draw the line? I mean, um, oh, yes. <laughs> I, I mean, I, 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 I mean, we're just talking about 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 um, Fiddler on the Roof. I mean, I mean, that's I think Budapest Opera Theatre has that in its repertoire as Anna Tevka, um, and across Central Europe, it's done as Anna Tevka. That's the title, and it clearly, I mean, there's a huge resonance in that part of the world. Mm. Um, you know, I, I love the fact, I mean, the fact I always love about, about Fiddler of the Roof, I remember Mark Steen's book, which we talked about months ago, um, Broadway Baby, Say Goodnight, and he's trying to anatomise how musicals work. He's saying, well, you know, the first song should give you some sense of what the show's about. When the curtain goes up, you find out what the show's about. And there you've got Fiddler of the Roof, and it's tradition. <laughs> there you are, word one. <laughs> you know, you're <laughs> yeah. straight, right, that's it, there you go. Um, but yeah, operetta, well... We, I, I remember it was, um, I've got various sort of musical theatre and operetta and opera CDs in my car and I sort of, they get a bit mixed up sometimes. I don't always remember what's going to come up. And I was listening to something and I think this is Lehar, this is a which Lehar operetta, I can't quite place it, can't quite place it. The orchestration, the style, the cut of the melody. Anyway, um, they started singing and it was Showboat. Um, Jerome Curd <laughs> and Oscar Hammerstein and... Um, yeah, if you're going to do a history of, of, of musicals, this, this is a sort, of, sort of the transitional point. This is where American operetta, Victor Herbert, that sort of thing morphs into something that is recognised by the Broadway musical. And it's, God, what, what a wrenching score. What an emotional score. What an incredible story. I mean, the, the combination, you know, I think it's sort of a, a, a quite a while after that show that the sort of Broadway really caught up with what had been achieved in it. We sort of see that now. It's become this classic uh, the recording I have is, you know, that is that one they reconstructed the original orchestrations back in the eighties. Um, John McGlynn, London Sinfonietta, and 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 wow, yeah, I mean, it sort of um, it, it sort of takes so many of the elements of operetta and sort of translates them into the new world and to this new style, this new way of telling a story um, through music. Um, and yeah, I mean, God, we're talking about the first word of um, you know the first words of Fiddle on the Roof tradition, the first word of Showboat, um, the first word of the first chorus as the curtain goes up we can't say it now it's that it's it's still so challenging it still op opens so many questions it's still such a you know a, a problematic and challenging and you know work that really cuts to the heart of a whole society and it's and, and its issues and yet does so it's such you know such a heart such, such warmth um I mean, there's oscar hammerstein you know his first really lasting hits and then he sort of had another sort of 15 years of, of flops basically before he um found himself with richard rogers and again reinvented the genre so so yeah i mean it's and yeah the, those melodies just sink into my mind but just you know it's i i i, I get them mixed up with the lehar all the time i think i think it was a real you know <laughs> it was a real it was a real kinship there isn't isn't another recording you have in your car uh slightly different south park <laughs> that's in your car isn't it I'm oh, sure you God. told me that. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's permanently in my car. I, I, when that show, when that movie came out, I mean, everyone was into the TV show, weren't they? 1990s, late 90s. It was, a, it was a, the cool thing to watch. Um, but I kind of went to watch it because I love the TV show. But I did not expect that I, you know, I went to see that movie four times, and, and by the end of it, I couldn't get anyone to co keep coming with me. I, I was kind of going in secret because I was kind of embarrassed people would know I'd been to see it again. And it's because of the scoring. It's because of the orchestration. Mark, Mark mentioned orchestration earlier and and i say you know it was raucous wild outrageous deeply offensive hilarious <laughs> comedy and and these fantastically catchy fantastically memorable unrepeatable songs these you know <laughs> you, i re <laughs> you remind me of yeah you know <laughs> while working on it when we were recording the orchestrations or the orchestra you know the score and the orchestrations for the songs Normally, you know, the orchestra just wants to hear the click. And if given the choice, they'll, they'll say, turn off the vocal. They don't want to hear the vocal at all. <laughs> so they weren't hearing the vocal when we were recording the second song of the movie, which I won't say the title of for fear that you'll be taken off the air. <laughs> but it has to do with an uncle. It has to do with uncle. Right. No, an uncle. Yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes. Um, yes. 
And, you know, so I had done the orchestration with Larry Blank, who I know works a lot in England. And uh, just this great over-the-top Oklahoma-ish kind of orchestration. But people knew it was the South Park movie. And so when we went to do a playback, usually just the first chairs will come in. You know, there might be like five or six people. The booth was more crowded than I'd ever known <laughs> on any movie I ever worked on. And so this was the first time they heard the lyrics. And I'll always uh-huh. remember... When we finished, Pam Goldsmith, the viola, lead violist, just walking out of the room with a hand on her forehead going, four years in the conservatory. Yeah. Four years in the conservatory. <laughs> I mean, but they loved it. They loved it. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm just, yeah. I'm making just that movie that was, thing here. It, just, it was yeah. just the greatest experience. Mm-hmm. You know, up until Mary Poppins Returns, it was most certainly the most thrilling movie experience I, I, I got to do to get to co-write songs with Trey, who's an absolute genius, and then do those orchestrations and arrangements and get to sing on it. And it was just, I got to do everything I ever wanted to do all in one movie. And, uh, wow. and, and Trey was so <laughs> trustful and they were so busy doing the animation that the week of, with the orchestra, I was by myself, no director, no producer, because that was Matt and Trey. And they just trusted me. And I got to just, what an experience, not have anyone looking over my shoulder, no one telling me to hurry up. You know, I could analyze, hmm, what if we change that second 16th to, you know, I could just do whatever. So that is my memory. It's it's so glorious. Yeah, it's it's such a glorious score. I mean, the orchestrations, I, 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 um, you know, I I say you you go in there, you go in there expecting this sort of dirty and rude cuddle cartoon that you see on the telly, and it's a symphonic score. And despite everything that happens, you know, this is where a kid gets killed setting his fart on the fire. It's where Satan is seen sodomizing Saddam Hussein. This film has a heart. (laughs) <laughs> the orchestration, oh, yeah. the writing, the orchestral writing gives it this heart somehow, this warmth. This actually makes it a credible story. You're not just sitting there watching an hour and a half of rude jokes. You're, you're getting you're getting emotional. And at the end, you know, when this high, you know, the violins go soaring up. I mean, I, you know, God, I'm, it, it, you know, it really gets you. Are we are yeah. we counting it as a musical? Is it Mark? Is well, it definitely it, it, a musical? I, I didn't have it on my list, but it's certainly a musical. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no question it, it, it's a musical of course i'm really hoping you do have one of yours on your list right charlotte i i'm a sort of gershwin and cole porter person and then ah. right up to the present day i really surprised myself and what i was thinking particularly about when i was preparing this was the what were the sort of the landmark moments in terms of musical theater and getting it to the public as it were and actually one of the major ones for me um was um uh, moulin rouge Because for me, this was a moment in the cinema. I can remember so clearly going to see this film. And for the first time, it it, it was effectively, we'd had Brigadoon and all of these wonderful films in the past that were kind of big, romantic, big budget things. And then they had kind of gone away for decades, I think. And then along came Moulin Rouge. And suddenly it it was a big romantic film in which the protagonist suddenly burst into song. And although a lot of it was medleys, there was this complete belter of come what may in the middle of it. And, and I also loved the fact that with Moulin Rouge, they, they sort of they reinvented the romantic film musical effectively with Traviata. Um, it's exactly, it's the penniless artist who falls in love with the courtesan and she dies in his arms at the end. It's exactly the same. And so for me, that was a moment. And then of course that paved the way for The Greatest Showman later on and all of these incredible scores that really get into the pop culture. And then I think that builds the sort of the musical future, the, the future for musicals, if you like. So that was kind of more hmm. where I was going and a lot of my choices. I, uh, I wanted to run screaming from the cinema during Moulin Rouge. I just, oh. I, couldn't, I couldn't bear it. I'm afraid it's just really not my thing. One of the ones I'm going to bring in, because I, I have to, uh, because it, it is one of my favorites. You've mentioned, that you thought it was uncool to mention Andrew Lloyd Webber. I've never thought it was uncool to mention Andrew Lloyd Webber. He's done some very good things. He's been mildly successful at what he does. But for me, Jesus Christ Superstar is an absolute knockout. Ding, ding, ding. We, we have the, on the, the same show on our list. <laughs> Fantastic. Ding, ding, ding. Well, I, I just, it comes up fresh every time for me. You know, this is a, uh, we have to remember that, you know, they were teenagers pretty much when they wrote Joseph. They were in their early 20s when they wrote Jesus Christ Superstar. And I think you can tell it's, 
it's got something, you know, it's, it's of its moment and it's certainly taking on board this kind of music that was around at that time, which a lot of musicals don't do. They have their own kind of musical style, if you like. But I just love the rock element of Jesus Christ Superstar. I knew the album before I knew the show, uh, uh, the stage show, that is. Uh, I, I love the original concept album that they put out because, you know, they couldn't sell the, the, the show at, at first, could they? So they, they did a concept album, which they paid for with uh, Murray Head as Judas and uh, Ian Gillen from Deep Purple as Jesus. Fan fantastic duo of, of voices there. But I also love the film version, um, actually. It's a bit weird, but Ted Neely is in that as Jesus, and he made a, an entire career out of playing Jesus. In fact, it is is now at least, I think, 30 years older than Jesus was when he died, and he's still playing him. <laughs> and uh, that's great to see too. But there's, there is such an energy to Jesus Christ Superstar. I think the great songs, there's a great kind of groove to it. Um, I love the different time signatures that, that Andrew uses in it. I love, it just gives it a, a vibrancy uh, uh, and an energy that I've, I've always loved. I, there's something about it. I'm not really interested in the story, although I always tell people that if it's not in Jesus Christ Superstar, I don't really know very much about that story. It's what taught me that much more than anything else. But yeah, okay, Mark, so it's one of your choices too. Go for it. Well, what, I think it came out in 1972. So that means I was 12. I mean, it just came out at a time that mm. was so perfect for me that there I was getting into musicals, but also listening to pop music on the radio. Mm. So suddenly here's a, this is a musical that is doing both yeah and it i mean it's so it's so great i mean it's there's so much to it and the once again the orchestrations the fact that andrew lloyd weber was and the band and the you know yeah. with the yeah. bass player is playing if you just really like put your headphones on and just zoom into any one thing there's so much going on musically and orchestrally. And like you mentioned, time signatures and, and tonalities that I hadn't, hadn't heard yet. And so that just made me really think, I think that was the first time I thought maybe I could write a musical one day. I, I do remember sitting at my uh, friend's piano. I used to go over friends across the street uh, a, a lot who was also a musician. And I think for around three days, I tried to write my own musical about like the creation of earth suddenly it seemed like it had to be biblical and i was trying to write about god looking down at the garden of Eden. it didn't go very far i only got around five measures into it but yeah jesus christ superstar totally blew my mind and uh that, those some great lyrics in there from tim rice as well and you know yes if you think that you're so cool walk across my swimming pool that kind of thing um yeah it's it's a it's a great great musical and uh the fact that like so many of these musicals it it just has such a great life. It just goes on and on and on and keeps coming back and pe new audiences appreciate it. You know, every generation that that's got to be the sign of a great musical. Richard, you wanted to come in? Well, you just, just can't mention Jesus Christ Superstar without mentioning that Shostakovich was a massive fan. He Absolutely. went to see it twice in London, apparently. Yeah. And, <laughs> yes, um, he did. Said, said he really loved it. Yep. Yep. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and Andrew writes about it very entertainingly in his book. Um, Mark, another one from you? Well, another one that became very important in my life was, and here's, it's a little footnote to my, I wouldn't say career, but in my life, that I was one of the handful of people that started the Rocky Horror Picture Show phenomenon of talking back to the screen and making up lines that fit in between their lines. It was just me, my friend Sal from New Jersey, we were went to the village one. We I was still living in New Jersey. I was well, I was only sixteen, I think, maybe. And we saw people online for this movie. And Sal said, "I hear this movie's really great." And we started becoming friends just online with these other people. And when we got in, we just I don't know. We just started doing it. I mean, so you can even look this up. I'm I am part of. I'm a, you know, it's documented. I was part of this thing. <laughs> and and also, I mean, it is a great musical and a great movie, and it has meant so much to generations of of kids who didn't feel like they fit in. They suddenly had this musical, this movie, to literally let their freak flag fly. <laughs> and um, so I thought, you know, that was a really meaning. I, I I went probably around seventy or so times, as opposed to my friend Sal, who became that 
head of the fan club and you know he saw it thousands of times and has literally made a whole life and career out of his association with rocky horror picture show uh i wanted to ask you about i once got to i got to work with tim curry a friend wrote a song for tim curry and asked me to help rehearse and it was just like maybe two years after i had sort of outgrown my rocky harness and uh he came over my apartment so i called my friend sal and I, i had to i just called him from my bedroom on a landline back then they were talking about like 1978 or done and i just let my bedroom door open a crack and just called him and just let the phone sit there in the doorway so he could hear tim i was playing piano for tim curry unbelievable <laughs> anyway I, all these memories are coming back to me i should do this more oh, often terrific yeah please do um i wanted to ask you about the difference between writing a musical for a film and writing it for the stage I mean, I often think one of the, the, the miracle of, mu- of, of a successful musical is that it got done at all. I think a lot of people don't realize just how many musicals get written and are never seen, or at least are seen once and then it's gone. And that all the musicals we talk about today, um, often it's just a series of bits of luck as well as great songs and all the rest of it. That, but it's all these um, unbelievable number of different things that come together to make it work. Um, and they they mostly fail, don't they? And I wonder. Yeah, whether I mean, I, in... I wrote four musicals before I moved to LA and suddenly was scoring movies. But yeah, I wrote four musicals that each one you think this is it, this is gonna put me, you know, on the map, and you know, and then it doesn't happen, and it's heartbreaking. And uh, <laughs> so I certainly know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I, I made the decision on my choices not to do ones that were only movies. Um, I, I, I just tried, I had to find a way of whittling them all down. So I decided to do that they were all originally stage um, musicals. But right. like Hairspray is an interesting one, isn't it? Because Hairspray starts as a movie, then it's a musical written by you, and then it becomes a film of the musical. And that's a, that's a whole other genre, isn't it? <laughs> that yeah. it starts and, one and place, ends in another. That is my fifth show. I was obnoxious enough to put my own show on my list, but how could I not? I mean, it was the most moving, important time in, of my life to have, after, like I mentioned, having written all these other musicals that never got on and then moved to LA and and luckily had all the success scoring movies and then luckily got asked to work on South Park, Bigger, Longer and Uncut, because yeah. that was the movie that got my name back on the lips of people in the th- theater community and so right. when Margot Lyon, who's the name of the woman who bought the rights to Hairspray, she kept asking people, who should I get to write the score to Hairspray? Who would fit like that John Waters sensibility? And luckily for me, everyone kept telling her, call Mark Shaman, call Mark Shaman. So that's how I got that gig. So I'm always thankful for South Park, not <laughs> only for the experience itself, but that it led to Hairspray. Well, I, I saw it. Well, I, I only saw it once. And I saw it in London. It was the uh, Michael Ball and Mel Smith, the the much missed Mel Smith um, right. in, in the two main roles. And what really struck me about it was just how much the audience loves it. They, it's just the feel good. They're up in their seats. They're out of their seats. It's just it lifts everybody that musical every time. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I you suddenly, uh, once again, you're spurring on my memories. I remember at Scott and I in Seattle, where we had our first, you know, our out of town tryout was in Seattle. Uh, and, you know, when you're writing a show or writing something, you kind of think the audience is just going to be a bunch of you. It's just going to be a whole lot of you, like clones of yourself. <laughs> like the, you just think, well, you know, uh, you write what you want and what you like and 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 then suddenly Scott and I peeked out of the curtain. We were backstage and we saw the audience. The theater in Seattle was huge. And it looked like George and Martha Washington from the front to back, just a bunch of old people and white hair. And we were like, oh my God, because it had seemed to be going so well in rehearsal. You could just feel the vibe. And suddenly we were like, oh, was this going to be the moment of truth? Oh, and I don't mean to be, sound like such an ageist. It's just that we were expecting to see, well, you know, gay men in their 40s, basically. So, <laughs> and then the show started and they had that reaction you just spoke of. They just all, you know, they just loved it and were smiling and 
enjoying it. And that's when we really knew, wow, we really got something here because there was no one like us out there and they were still loving it. Yeah. Yeah. Hairspray was, you know, the, I, I've said before, it was something that doesn't come uh, easy for a Jew. It gave me contentment. Mm. You know, I had <laughs> wanted to write a musical for so long. And the fact that I got to write one that's so joyous and, and yet so, about something so important and so important to me, I mean, I was, you know, in, t in junior high school or middle school, I was Tracy Turnblad with a penis, basically. I mean, I, I was that character, a chubby little kid who just wanted to hang out with the black kids. I, I, I loved black music. I loved black culture. I just wanted to be, feel like they liked me. And I just, so it was just the most perfect musical for me to write. And, um, and, you know, as maybe obnoxious as it is to say, if people like Hairspray, I, it, it makes me feel like they like me because it's the best part of me is that musical. I'm, I'm There are other bad parts of me that aren't <laughs> that musical, but that's the best part of me. And so I really take it personally in a nice way, yeah. uh, the people's reaction to that. Um, and do you do you still go and see the show? Because I I know it it's a very different experience, isn't it? You uh, everyone has this experience who's a composer, but but actually to to stand at the back of the stalls and watch an audience watch your show is quite yeah, an experience. Of, yeah. of course, I've I've yeah. Oh yeah, Scott and I used to always go like during the run on on Broadway. We would peek out from the side curtain, and like during "You Can't Stop the Beat," you, you'd see eight years old to eighty eight years old people all with the same look on their face. And that was so wonderful to see <laughs> such a diverse crowd, but all with the same expression on their face. Yeah. And then, you know, I have friends who have kids who's or like my high school did it and my middle school did it, you know? So I went to go, you know, if you look at my Facebook page, you might think, oh my God, he does nothing but go see hairspray <laughs> at schools. But you know, it's cause I know someone in it or can you imagine my own high school putting on the show or the Maybe. junior high school? where the piano that I sat and played endlessly cut gym class constantly to go play that piano in that auditorium. And now they were putting on the show that I wrote. I mean, yeah, my mind was just blown. And, and it's always, sometimes I go, Oh, I don't know if I really want to hear or see this, uh, you know, the tempos can be wrong and the, you know, the kids may not be able to sing it great. And then I'm always so happy I went yeah. because it's, it's so joyous and so moving and, um, yeah. I'm just Wonderful. so happy that it happened. <laughs> Wonderful. Right, Charlotte, um, throw in another couple for, for us that, uh, that we, we need to mention. Okay, well, I mentioned George Gershwin earlier. So here's my George Gershwin offering its funny face. Um, I think George and Ira Gershwin were just one of the apps. I, I have an awful lot to thank them for and my music teacher because we, um, when I was a teenager in my late teens, my music teacher started cabaret evenings at school where we basically covered all of the 20s, 30s, 40s cabaret repertoire, those sort of songs by Gershwin and Porter. And I just learned, I probably, I knew that repertoire more than the classical repertoire, if I'm honest, when I'm 17. And Gershwin was one of those. And I think any songwriting duo which comes up with a romantic song which has the line, I'm a poached egg without a piece of toast when I'm a beef <laughs> without you. I mean, it's just gorgeous. I'm a Yorkshire pudding without a beef to roast. And so on to Funny Face, um, started life in 1927 as Smarty. And again, it's this story of something that didn't quite work the first time around. It was a bit of a flop. And then they had to go back to the drawing board, do it again, 1928. Finally, they hit on it. And then for a Broadway musical, instantly over to the UK, it had this London life and then it toured the regions and then back to London. And one of my big sort of sorrows in life is that Adele Astaire stopped dancing before they started filming Fred Astaire. I know. And oh, just, I would have, I would give anything to have seen her dance. She was, she was clearly amazing. And of course it was Fred and, Fred and Adele Astaire, this, um, this first stage musical. And it was the first time Fred Astaire was dancing in top hat and tails. Um, and then beautifully for the film remake with Audrey Hepburn, they get Fred Astaire in again. And it's, and then they fill um, the, there were only four songs from the original um, in the film. And then they just added a whole load of more Gershwin hits. And it's just magic, the whole thing, um, Audrey Hepburn. And then the other one that I wanted to mention um, was Frozen actually. 
Um, and I thought Frozen was, it's so easy, look at Richard's face. Um, it's so easy to see it as a pile of kind of fluffy pink and turquoise tats when you think of Frozen. But actually, mm -hmm. this was a score that was a bit of a landmark for Disney, I think, for years, um, where obviously we'd had it ain't um, the, the Bare Necessities, Jungle Book, and we're all of these true animated musicals. But then for years, actually, there were these Disney musicals where there was kind of a big song that a pop star was singing, and then that was it. And then along came Frozen, and it was just hit after hit after hit. And not just that, it was a musical which, for the first time, seemed to be channeling the Broadway vibe. Um, even down to having Adina Menzel play Elsa. And if you listen to Let It Go, it's effectively defying gravity, just Disney-fied. <laughs> um, it's just listen to them side by side and the links are everywhere. And it was so clever. And of course, absolutely whopping hit. And then they did again. I didn't think they could do it again. And then with Frozen 2, blinking brilliant. My husband and I were literally rolling around the floor laughing with Lost in the Woods, this kind of REO speed wagon channeling soft rock with a with a reindeer and um, it, it was just brilliant so frozen frozen is in, frozen an interesting one because I, frozen completely passed me by because i didn't have children mm. at that point um and now i've got two boys and frozen will not be allowed in the house ever but no um, you no, have no no to. no god no but it, but what happened was that in the, the film music concerts i was doing people started to say oh we've got to do let it go we've got to do let it go and i say what the hell is let it go what is it what is this film called frozen <laughs> and they did completely passed me by there's been this enormous cultural event but if you didn't have children, it, it meant literally nothing. Um, anyway, it's very, very interesting one. Uh, Richard, what about you? Some ones to throw in from you. Uh, well, you're talking, Charlotte talks about Gershwin. I mean, that, there's that thing with, you know, apart from Showboat, up, up to the coming of Rodgers and Hammerstein, basically the shows of that period, virtually none of them are kind of revived or seemingly revivable. Mm. They're just kind of... Um, pegs on which these incredible scores these incredible collections of songs were hung that seems to be how how they've come down to posterity so it's kind of hard to find a single show in that period that really still you have a chance to see there are film versions the film versions are usually quite heavily different from what was done on broadway the revivals which radically rework them i mean it's an art form that's always changing is it? it's always adapting um but yeah i mean um the, the songwriter songwriting combination that really really got me in that period um it was, I, I think it's time I was in my late 20s, I'd been dumped hard, dumped really hard. And um, I found solace in the Rogerton Hart songbook. And there's one show by Rogerton Hart. Um, I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's great. It's great. It, you know, it's, this is not the Rogers of Rogerton Hammerstein. I mean, he's, it's a song sheet or two act career he had. This first act, he, he, was, he was fast, he was witty, jazzy, all those things. Um, and Larry Hart, uh, this kind of four foot high alcoholic um, guy who was in with all sorts of strange, strange characters, gangsters, and all sorts, and left this very rackety life. Um, just have this incredible ability for turning out these sort of snappy one liners that somehow cut straight to the heart of of, of feeling lonely, of feeling feeling devastated, of feeling of feeling dumped, um, of, of feeling puzzled by the whole mystery of love and um yeah the, the one show they uh, the, they wrote well a couple of shows they wrote that really stand up pal joey is the one a pretty, pretty much a penultimate show they wrote together about 1940 or thereabouts 1939 40 i think which is again it's kind of sleazy low life tales of totally unpleasant characters acting like adults do with each other you know um dumping each other cheating on each other being unreliable being cynical <laughs> being um doing making da bad choices and then regretting them i mean my funny valentine is a real song with has escaped from that score but it's the whole score holds up in that way it has that atmosphere it has that sort of sense of cynicism wisecracking world weary at the same time it's a hell of a toe tapper you know it's great numbers mm. in that in that show and then, um, I mean, the musicals, the first musical I ever played in was Carousel, and I didn't know at the time what I was getting into. I was going in with the top, really. <laughs> you know, this is an Amdram performance. I was just in the pit earning some pocket money, and um, I didn't realise I, I was about to play a masterpiece. God, what a score. Mm. Um, it's another one that's despised the condition of operetta. I think um, when it's first premiered, um, someone, I think it's Brooks Atkinson, said if it was any more enjoyable, it would probably be opera. Um, <laughs> it's any less enjoyable, sorry. <laughs> any no, less enjoyable, say, yeah. it would be opera, sorry. Um, <laughs> and um, but yeah, you got that whole sort of, yeah, that whole Roger and Hammerstein street they had in the 40s of Oklahoma, with Carousel, with South Pacific, these complex musicals are still, you know, the idea that it's ex escapist, you know, <laughs> South Pacific, in 1948, you're writing a musical about sort of a war which four years ago was probably killing 
you know, damaging the lives of everyone in the audience. Um, you know, and there it is dealing with racial issues, dealing with, you know, you know, basically current affairs um, and making this huge full-blooded story out of it. Um, yeah, hell of a score. And then another musical, more recent musical that, you know, again, aspires the condition of operetta, very obviously. You know, it's basically a love letter to operetta, which I really, really adore. Um, is is a little night music, Sondheim. We've got to have a Sondheim in there. Um, you talked about the orchestration. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the, the whole thing's in triple time, isn't it? It's buried to waltz yeah. time or triple dance time. The entire score right. is in some kind of waltz time. You've got these waltz sequences all the way, just weaving through it. And this sort of middle European, well, it's Scandinavia, isn't it? It's Sweden at the turn of the century. It's an Ingmar Bergman adaptation. And, and like Mark said again, the atmosphere of the orchestration, that's what makes that score, really. I mean, the songs are great, but the whole world you're pulled into is that sort of silvery, silken orchestration, which I think was by Jonathan Tunick. Jonathan Tunick, um, yeah. Yeah, that's right. And what, what, I mean, it just really it sinks in. It's like, you know, it's as if Ravel had written, written a Broadway musical. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Um, you, you mentioned about playing, playing in, I've, I've been playing in musicals since I was, I don't know, nine or 10 as, as a drummer. And it's, I'm really interested in the musicals that we used to play a lot in schools that no one really does anymore, or at least I don't think they do. Things like Godspell was huge. Um, Stephen Schwartz, Smike. Anyone heard of Smike? It was uh, uh, based on Nicholas Nickleby. I remember uh, that. We did that a few times. I mean, Greece played the, the stage show. Everyone always thinks of Greece really as the movie now. But it was a stage show, and it's a diff- It's quite different, and the, a number of the big songs in the movie are not actually in the stage show. And in fact, when people do the stage show now, it's pretty much demanded that the ones that are in the movie that everyone knows must be put in, because otherwise people leave disappointed. Um, and the Wiz, this um, a black version of the Wizard of Oz with Quincy Jones songs in it. Exactly. Um, Ease on down the road. Yeah, we, we did that a few times. People love that. But they're, they're not really done that much anymore. But of course, the one that I used to love playing over and over again, the one that musicians always want to play in, um, apart from violas, because there aren't any, uh, is West Side Story. I mean, we have to talk about West Side Story. I think it's the greatest musical ever. I think a lot of people share my opinion uh, on social media when I was asking them about this uh, this week. I think it's it's the greatest because I mean it it has the great advantage of course of one of the brilliant stories based on Romeo and Juliet um, a great book brilliant lyrics by Young Sondheim and then this incredible score by Bernstein I mean West Side Story and On the Town are my two favorite musicals I think because just purely musically they're on another level I think from from anything else they're just the most extraordinary skill that that man had in not just writing great melodies, but in it just everything about the music is sophisticated. It is smart. It is beautifully put together. It's harmonically complicated. Some of those melodies are incredibly difficult, but actually sound perfectly natural, which is of course the great skill. And as, as a musical West Side Story just gives you everything you want. And let's remember an extremely downbeat ending. And if you can make a great piece of work especially a musical where so many people go to have a good time out of something that ends so tragically, then I think you, you, you've obviously hit it. And the fact that it's still done all over the world all the time, like so many of the musicals we've talked about today, I think is, is the greatest tribute to it. I just, I just don't think there's anything else like it. The music is so cool and so groovy and so wonderfully done i don't know what else i mean everybody's said everything that they need to say about west side story ever so there's not much more that can be added but mark west side story for you of course i'm like <laughs> for everything that you just said uh, another one that i i did in my teenage years mm. and oh boy that band sounded terrible <laughs> 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 there are a bunch of 15 year olds who just could not hit those notes but um yeah i mean oh my lord the string writing uh, the composition i mean yeah i mean oh my god oh then the, i always that suspended oh. fourth against the yeah. third uh, yeah i you know it's West Side Story, of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, people, I know the fact that they, you know, have made a new movie of it. 
And I know that shocked a lot of people, but I, I sort of subscribe to the idea that like, you know, you don't stop putting on Hamlet and you don't say like, well, they did Hamlet perfectly in 1683. So, right. you know, <laughs> let's never do it. No. <laughs> I mean, because unfortunately there are a lot of young people who won't watch it on TV or something. So they simply won't experience West Side Story. Mm. Well, now when a new movie comes out, they will. Yeah, so can't this is Spielberg. Wait. Spielberg's new version, right? Yeah. It's coming out very soon. Um, I was mulling over myself preparing for this. Why is it that West Side Story everybody knows and on the town is wonderful, but it's just not in the popular consciousness um, in the same way? I've been to see it twice. I love it so much, but I think it is well, all because of it, exactly what you say. It's the complexity of the score, the rhythms, the the harmonies there is just something about it that's the movie is very popular then the movie of on the town is very very popular yeah, of course that doesn't is. have most of the of bernstein's great songs in it right. unfortunately that that's that's the only thing but i yeah i think i think um musically actually uh, on the town is it's, it's equal i mean i i could have probably chosen five just of, of bernstein um hmm. because it, there's so many wonderful things that he's done for for, for theater but um, the thing I mean, that makes a musical, the, the I mean, this is no brilliant uh, thought, but I know from firsthand experience from both sides, it's when all the collaborators all are on the same wavelength mm -hmm. and they're all singing the same show. So in West Side Story, everyone, music, the lyrics, the choreography, the book, everything about it, just you know, you're all speaking the same language, and it's lightning in a bottle, and mm -hmm. and when that can happen then these brilliant shows exist. Now, I mean, some of the ones we haven't even mentioned yet, I mean, Guys and Dolls is another one that yeah. was on, on my list, Frank Lesser. Uh, I mean, again, I love the movie version of, uh, of that because um, I'm a big Stubby K fan. Uh, he's brilliant. Sit Down, You're Rocking the Boat, one of the great, very short songs in the musical. Right. Doesn't outstay its welcome, does what it needs to do, gets out. Um, Les Miserables, no one's mentioned Les Miserables. I, the, the, I the, most, the, the single most boring evening I've ever spent in my entire life, but people love it and I have to accept this. Um, and Sound of Music, we've just sort of mentioned in passing, but uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the most popular musicals ever written, surely. I mean, where, where do you stand on Sound of Music then, Mark? My heart will be blessed with the sound of music i mean and i'll sing once more i mean it's it's perfection and, and, and that might be a case where the movie actually improved on the stage show yeah maybe improved is the wrong word but what it didn't use from the stage show was wasn't the greatest loss in in the, in the telling of the story and such mm -hmm. a sumptuous movie uh you know, Richard Rogers, I mean, you could study that man forever, as Richard put. He had two completely separate acts. You wouldn't even recognize, really, the Richard Rogers of Rogers and Hart with the Richard Rogers of Oscar Hammerstein. It yeah. was a totally new um, vocabulary. My God, I mean. Yeah. Um, other, one, other ones we have, I mean, we, we mentioned Mary Poppins, Singing in the Rain, of course. Surely the greatest musical film of all, of all time. Um, Jungle Book, someone mentioned Jungle Book uh, on social media. That's another great musical. I suppose a lot of people don't really think of them as musicals necessarily. Um, but there's also, I mean, two huge hits from the, la from the last few years or so, um, both of which were ones where you, you know, you could, you killed to get a ticket, you couldn't get a ticket, or they were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds per ticket to get. Um, Book of Mormon, which is, Trey Parker and Matt Stone again, uh, huge, hugely popular musical and very controversial. And of course, Hamilton. I mean, I was mentioned Hamilton. So Hamilton with Lin-Manuel Miranda. Um, I mean, goodness, I mean, it won the Pulitzer Prize for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> and people could not get tickets. And, it, you know, when it came to London, it was, it, it was years in the making. People couldn't wait. They practically rebuilt the theater in order for it to be done because it was such a huge, huge success. What about these titles, Mark? Or anyone. Well, yeah, anyone. I'm, mean, you know, these are uh, phenomenons. I mean, Hamilton, my God, it's, it's another example of everyone on the same wavelength. I mean, when I think of Hamilton, uh, one of the things I think of most is the sound design was so brilliant. You could he hear everything you were supposed to hear, every 
part of the orchestration and the arrangements, the chorus was so brilliantly mixed. So, I mean, that's sort of a behind the scenes kind of viewpoint of it, but it just goes to show what makes a truly great musical is when the whole team is all working towards the same goal. But also it, it doesn't, it, 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 I mean, I was saying about West Side Story, it doesn't really, it, I, to me, West Side Story doesn't really sound like a musical. It's not got that musical sound. I don't really know what that is, but it, it just, it's different. Hamilton, it sounds like West Side Story. Right, I mean, exactly. But Hamilton also creates its own musical language, it, it, right. an unusual one within musical theatre. I mean, we use imagine that, what it was like for Scott, for Scott and I when we, doing Mary Poppins Returns. Not only did we have the brilliance of the Sherman brothers there on one shoulder, and then they said, oh, by the way, we've cast Lin-Manuel Miranda. So, so now Jack. we're writing songs yeah. for the man who literally just wrote the musical that has changed the, the shape of the earth. <laughs> so I could barely go to the piano to compose because the weight on my shoulders, I could, I was at the pedals, but anyway, uh, and, but, and Lynn is, is just as sweet and as a good, a good, good man as you could ever want to meet. Another one I wanted to throw in, by the way, um, this is on behalf of my my mum, actually, because she really enjoyed this. And it's a small, much smaller musical, but it was very successful, actually, and it caught the imagination was uh, a musical Come From Away, which uh, was written by Irene Sankoff and David Hine. It's about this um, uh, on 9-11 when um, thousands of people on, on airplanes landed uh, in Newfoundland and had to stay there for a long time and were housed by the local people there with great generosity. And uh, one of the reasons it resonated, I think with my family who went to see it is because my uncle was one of those people on one of those planes. He was flying back wow. from, from the UK back to where he lives in, in the US. And they landed in Newfoundland and were there for a, a substantial amount of time and you know slept on the floors of, of village halls and people brought food and all the rest of it. And that's the story of the musical. So uh, it does resonate and um, uh, everyone keeps urging me to go and see it. Of course, I haven't been able to see it in the last year, but I, I will. I will get to see it. I'm sure. But there, there we go. Constantly finding new stories uh, of of actually, in this case, very relatively new, uh, recent events to to set to a musical. It doesn't seem often. It, some of these subjects don't seem like natural fits for musicals, and yet people people make it work. I think it's quite interesting. Uh, any others that we can throw in? Anybody? My well, fair lady. Some, oh. My fair, my fair lady. lady. Yeah, yes, I, I yeah. was just thinking of my fair lady. Yeah. Because like, I was just thinking about one of the, my favorite thing about certain musicals is the brilliance of the songwriters and the lyricists with uh, On the Street Where You Live being an example, where they write songs, where they purposely write the song so that it can live outside of the musical and you don't really need to know the story. And yet it was perfect in the musical. Two other songs, uh, one of them actually written by Alan J. Lerner, who wrote My Fair Lady, uh, from a musical um, On a Clear Day You Can See Forever. He wrote, to me, this is the shining example. It's amazing. He wrote a song called What Did I Have That I Don't Have. In the musical, it's sung by a woman who realizes the psychiatrist she's gone to see to stop smoking has fallen in love with her former self that she was in a past life who comes out during the hypnosis sessions and so she sings a song what did i have that i don't have it's totally about what is it that in my past life that i was that i'm not now and the man that i love doesn't love me he loves her but when you listen to it outside of the show it's just a song about a woman singing you know what was it about the beginning of our relationship that has has you know the flame has gone but to take such a bizarre plot from that musical and be able to create a song that works so well another example of that is if he walked into my life from mame a song that's sung by an aunt about a fight she just had with her nephew who had this very strange upbringing with her, her life and so the lyrics are all about the very unique strange life she gave this kid as he was growing up but you can just sing it outside the show if you walk into my life about a man who I have, you know, broken up with. But would I do, would I make the same mistakes? It's such a brilliant thing. So, yeah, uh, On the Street Where You Live, another perfect example. And a perfect song for a stalker nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Wicked, Wicked is another one we should mention. Um, the Producers is another one that's been a huge hit, of course. Another one that 
that uh, started as a film about a musical and then ended up being a musical about a, 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 a musical and then became a film of that musical that's about the musical. Yeah, that's its own sub-genre there, isn't it? <laughs> um, I, last thing I wanted to ask you, Mark, before we, before we wrap up, one of the really successful uh, genres within musical theatre uh, in recent years has been the jukebox musical. What, do you, what are your feelings about jukebox musicals, these musicals where they take an existing catalogue, often of a band or of, a, of an artist, and, and make it, and then stitch those songs together to make some sort of narrative musical? Well, I mean, I, I mean, of course, a, a part of me shares with the feelings that many people have about like, oh, it should be original scores. It's a shame that all so many theaters are now taken up with musicals uh, that are jukebox musicals. But if you do it great, it's great. I mean, Mamma Mia was so brilliantly done. Who could argue with with the humor and the artistry which which they set about doing what they did? But on the other hand, I do remember Scott and I, when we were working on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory on the West End, walking by Mamma Mia, and the sign literally says it, you already know you're going to love it. <laughs> so that was this modern producing is right. about what can we give them that they already love? I mean, so how can we be one step ahead? So it is a shame that that has to be so often now happens but yeah you know. I, I, people used to say to me oh you, you you must go and see we will rock you as, as a as a huge queen fan you should go and see we will rock you and of course i went to see it but i think in the first week and it was so awful and so depressing <laughs> and i thought to myself no i love these songs too much i don't want to see them in this context it doesn't work except of course you know i'm wrong and millions and millions and millions of people all around the world are right aren't they so hey there you are. Richard, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I was just going to make throw, throw in the sort of um, reflection that what's it, the film of um, Singing in the Rain is a jukebox musical. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was yeah. built around a catalogue of pre-existing songs. I think it was, wasn't it Arthur Freed? Was it yeah. at, the, yes. at the unit at MGM who basically um, decided his royalty catalogue, you know, his royalties were getting a bit thin on his songwriting catalogue, just handed a bundle of his songs to the team and said, right, make me a musical out of my songs. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And one of my favorite it. movie musicals, besides Singing in the Rain, is The Bandwagon, which mm. is also, as you just said, it is a jukebox. You know, so yeah, if it's done with great taste and artistry, you know, I'll watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you along here. Really, really fantastic. Thanks so much for for doing this. We really, really of appreciate course. it. I hope I didn't blabber on too much. No, no, it's all perfect. And love, <laughs> love the music as well. Are you able to tell us anything that you are working on? I know you're working on something you're not allowed to tell us, but is there anything you are allowed to tell us? Well, I mean, on? we've written a new musical of Some Like It Hot because there yeah. actually was a musical actually performed in England more than in America, <laughs> uh, Sugar. And it was and then they changed the name and called it Some Like It Hot and it toured a lot and it had more success in England, yeah. but it never really kind of stuck. And so the producers came to us and uh, the producers were some of the people who worked on the TV show Smash with Scott and I. And since on Smash, we were writing for Marilyn Monroe and actually wrote one or two songs as if there was a musical of Some Like It Hot. They said, would you like to write a new musical of Some Like It Hot? At first we thought, well, I mean, no, how, you know, you can't, Jewel Stein wrote Sugar. I mean, how do you try to, you know, come after that? But. But then they had the idea uh, of, you know, changing the race of some of the characters and the idea that without getting too heavy about it, the idea that a man dresses as a woman and discovers he feels more natural than he ever has his whole life. So we are, I hate the expression, looking at it through a modern lens um, <laughs> and hopefully won't ruin it. But, but there's so much about it. I mean, even just the title, Some Like It Hot, it's so current. It's such a brilliant phrase. And I don't think it's ever even comes up in the movie. Some like it hot. It's all about some like this, some like that. It's wh how you're born, the things that you want and are drawn to. That's just the, that's what God made it this way. This is how he wants it. That's how we start. Like the intro to that song is, uh, well, 
Uh, the world is like a greasy spoon. The man upstairs is a maitre d. He throws a menu down, lets you peruse, then asks you, what'll it be? <laughs> so anyway, it's you know, it was great to write a song about something like it hot and about whatever the sex or the gender or whatever. So, but meanwhile, we have no idea now when it's going to get on. Um, it's so <laughs> sad. We were literally just so ready to go out of town. And now we're just sitting here waiting for yeah, years yeah. and years and years. You've, you've reminded me uh, of another one of my favorite musicals, which is within a film, uh, a film called The Tall Guy. And it's a, uh, a film about the, right. uh, it's a musical about the elephant man. It's a, it's a skit on, on it. It's very, I haven't very seen that in funny, years but, since it came out. Yeah. I need but to you, watch but that you remind me that there's a lovely bit uh, after in the after show party where they took it, it says to the producer, what are you working on next? And he said, I'm working on a, a musical uh, about Richard the third. Is it uh, any hits? He said, well, there's one called, I've got a hunch. I'm going to be King um, on, on that level, is there going to be a song in Some Like It Hot called Nobody's Perfect? How do you deal with the mo one of the most famous lines in all movies? Well, we're dealing with it. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to say too much. Um, <laughs> but we found a way to use it that I think is, is quite lovely. Um, you'll see. We will. I we'll hope you'll see. Yeah, we, I'm sure we will. We're looking forward to it. Mark, thanks again. And thanks also, of course, to Richard and to uh, Charlotte. Next week, our guest is the American conductor, teacher, lecturer, and regular listener to this show, Christopher Russell, who will be helping us choose our top five orchestral works by American composers. Looking Ooh. forward to that. See you then.